Cool. All right. We have a much fuller house there than we thought, so thanks so much for coming by. I'm Will. I'm a software engineer here at Snorkel, and today we're going to talk about how we redesigned Snorkel's interactive ML systems to power our core enterprise products. And hint, hint, we used Ray. So just some signposting, we're first going to give a bit of background about Snorkel, uh, and then talk about the specific challenges we faced and why we had to redesign our ML systems. Then we'll go over the different architecture designs we evaluated and why we chose Ray to implement our redesign. And then lastly, we're going to drill down into how our system works. So first of all, I just wanted to thank all the wonderful folks who helped make this happen. Anytime a data scientist in one of the world's largest organizations wants to start an ML project, they turn to Snorkel and directly hit the systems that we built together as a team. All right, so I'm going to start off with a bit of background about Snorkel. When the world's largest companies want to develop and deploy ML apps, they turn to Snorkel. Our flagship product, Snorkel Flow, allows data scientists to programmatically label massive data sets without needing to use human labelers and then train models on those data sets. So using programmatic labeling actually leads to 10 to 100 times faster AI development for the world's largest companies. So what is this programmatic labeling magic? It's a technique that was developed out of Chris Ray's lab at Stanford, and we rely on people, so data scientists, writing heuristics in the form of code. So these can be if-else statements or calling out to models, which can be anything from logistic regression to large language model inference calls to spit out these weak labels for data points. And it turns out that if you stack enough of these heuristics together, you get some really damn good labels. And to get good labels, you need to iteratively tweak your heuristics. You can't just generate magic out of thin air. It takes a lot of work. Um, and so as you can imagine, you need to you know, tweak your heuristics, get your labels out, then train your models on those labels, and you have to rinse and repeat this process. And so within Snorkel, users iterate on their data in a part of the product called Label Studio. And users actually spend around 75% of their time in this part of the product. So as a result, this process needs to be really interactive. And I'm going to show you what this roughly looks like. So here's a quick demo. Um, this video will play. All right. So here I'm trying to label my data set, uh, and I'm trying to find all image images of apples. And so as you can see, I've kind of run this. Actually, what's happening in the background is there's an image model inference going on. And I'm running that inference over a lot of uh, uh, images in my data set. So the core idea I'm trying to drive home here is that our users need to run these arbitrary and really complex workloads over large data sets that can span gigabytes over and over and over again. And these workloads can be anything from if-else statements to LLM inference. And in the past, Label Studio would actually run these workloads over data using Dask, which is a framework for parallel processing of data frames. And so now I'm going to talk about the problem that we faced um, and kind of you know, what we saw as a company. So around mid last year, we had some really exciting opportunities here at Snorkel. Our customer base is growing. They're dramatically expanding the size of data they want to work with in Label Studio into the tens of gigabytes to millions of row range. And they also needed foundation model and LLM capabilities in Label Studio, like running models like Clip, BERT, or GPT. So while these are some great problems to have, we ran up against some serious roadblocks. Our previous infrastructure ran on Dask, which prevented us from meeting that customer demand that I just talked about. And Snorkel is often deployed on resource-constrained, self-hosted enterprise customer environments. So we can't just arbitrarily scale up and out like a cloud-hosted solution can. So building these platforms is actually really tough. And to also double click into why we face these scaling blockers, um, early on at Snorkel and before my time there, Label Studio was built on top of Dask. So all of those you know, iterative interactive data operations and ML workloads were running over and over again. That's all being run on Dask. And it was a fantastic technology we used early on at the company, and it got us to our Series C and well beyond. But we outgrew it. We needed something more reliable that could work at scale. To drill down an additional level of detail at much larger data set sizes with many data sets pinned in memory, we saw Dask make these crazy scheduling decisions and shuffles that would lead to really high uh, latencies for a lot of our workloads. We also couldn't easily do memory or scheduling uh, of workloads on our cluster. And we also needed fine-grained control over worker life cycles. Uh, and our you know, Dask components would also leak memory through time, which would lead to nodes ooming. And we really felt this impact as a company. It affected our customers, they would face outages in our system. Ooms would cause uh, ooms caused by memory leaks, and our performance would suffer too. ML workloads would take a hell of a long time sometimes. We would also hit a scaling wall 
And it was also tough for us to build new products and to build towards the future uh, using LLMs or you know, computer vision models. So how did we solve this problem? How do we move past this? Um, first, I'll give a bit of background about our requirements, and then I'll talk through some of the approaches we considered and how we ended up settling on a design. So surprise, surprise, we had to re-turf, completely rebuild our interactive ML systems. And so just to run through some of the functional requirements, at the end of the day, we had to run these embarrassingly, uh, embarrassingly parallel user-submitted workloads over customer data. And this customer data would be pretty big, and it also had to be interactive, had to work quickly. It would need to support multiple users without the system tipping over. Now, I want to take some time to do a quick aside on one of the biggest constraints as well that we had to work with. Uh, for many of our customers, Snorkel is deployed in the server racks or in a self-hosted fashion. So resources are actually really scarce. We can't vertically scale up or out like a cloud-hosted solution can, especially when data sets are larger than memory. So in order for us to even be usable or deployable, not dead on arrival, we have to use out-of-core algorithms because there's often not enough RAM to keep the full data set resident. So we have these requirements where we have to deal with this crazy supportability requirement, um, and we have to deliver on a reasonably performant experience. But if a user has more resources to spare, we want to deliver a very performant experience. So how do we satisfy all of these pretty divergent requirements? Skipping to the end here, we achieved this using a hybrid approach, a hybrid architecture. As it turns out, using an out-of-core approach helps us deploy anywhere because we can process any size data set using a finite pool of resources. But at the same time, using in-core approaches allows us to deliver a low latency experience for well-resourced customer environments. But first, we should talk about our design process because we're engineers here. Um, the first approach we considered was to build a full out-of-core processing solution. So workers would apply operations over chunks of a data set loaded from disk. Um, these chunks would be GC, garbage collected, to return memory to the resource pool. And all of our users running workloads on any data set would share the same pool of resources. The natural architecture to implement this would be a worker pool. This is excellent for resource-constrained environments because we can process any size data set, even with limited memory. And we can deploy this on any compute-constrained customer environment, and it would still work. The issue is that if you're a customer that has way more compute to spare, and you can afford to cache a lot more data and memory, we're still doing all this expensive disk to RAM I.O. fetching with this worker pool architecture. And this isn't, this isn't great. This is a severe latency bottleneck for us. So since the worker pool architecture alone can give us the performance we needed, it was time to also consider in-core approaches that leaned into caching. And so rather than constantly load chunks of a data set and then garbage collect those chunks, why not just pin that data set in memory? User workloads would get routed to run on those data sets and minimize I.O. cost. So what we're doing here is we're caching data at the data set level, and it removes a lot of I.O. latency. Um, but it assumes a lot about what's useful to cache for the user. For example, when a user interacts with the data set, that user might generate a lot of intermediate results or metadata, and we have to store that somewhere as well. This architecture doesn't leave enough room for that. But also, each user might have their own version of some fine-tuned model that, he, that they need to store in, in RAM or in VRAM somewhere. So what if for every user working on a data set, we just spun up dedicated resources just for that user data set interaction? We'd have dedicated space to cache each user's you know, private stuff uh, with that data set and while maintaining memory safety. So we're essentially caching at the highest level of granularity here. We acknowledge that we're duplicating the data set a lot. Um, however, what we get in return is infrastructural flexibility because you know, this is fine-grained caching. And this is a trade-off we're willing to make. We can optimize for memory later. So on the one hand, while out-of-core approaches allow us to support any customer, no matter how resource-constrained they are, on the other hand, in-core approaches allow us to deliver the low-latency experiences customers want when they have more resources to spare by caching and avoiding I.O. So why don't, why, why don't we just combine these approaches into a, a hybrid architecture? Uh, this was the solution we ended up going with. And by caching data sets, metadata, and models in memory on the right-hand side, we can deliver really low latency experiences for our customers on massive data sets. But if we ever run out of resources, we can always fall back on this you know, worker pool on the left-hand side, and everything will still work no matter what. And compute-bound workloads are also great on the worker pool as well. And here's just a bit more detail on what this looks like. I see some people taking photos. I'll give you a few seconds for that. Cool. As you can see, we can leverage the strengths of both approaches to basically get the best of both worlds. So this is really cool. 
Um, now, why, why Ray? Uh, we chose Ray to help build this architecture because it gives us the abstractions that we were looking for. For example, it naturally served our architecture needs by you know, giving us amazing interfaces for worker pools and for actors. So it was on honestly fit like a glove here. Um, as well as helping us ensure memory safety so that we don't tip nodes over. You know, it helps us bin pack really well. And it's also a breeze to horizontally scale. All right, so why does any of this matter for Snorkel? Um, we spend a lot of time, a lot of effort building this. The impact of all of this is that it's actually helped scale our product by orders of magnitude. It's helped us unblock new product initiatives around foundation models and LLMs, all while maintaining platform stability by avoiding ooms. And yes, that is a, that is a two order of magnitude increase in the amount of data we can process. And we can now build these products that involve text and image foundation models and deploy them on customer environments, which is super cool. All right, so now we're going to drill down into how all this actually even works. So again, I want to drill home this core idea. We are running these really complex operations over a lot of data over and over again, and this needs to happen quickly. So first, we're going to talk about how the out-of-core part of the architecture does this at a high performance um, before my partner in crime, John, joins me on stage and talks about the in-core component. So we implemented the out-of-core component as a worker pool with each worker pulling chunks of data from disk into RAM. And the first core idea is to use data chunking and parallelism for memory safety and for speed. So let's go over how this happens. Let's say we have a bunch of operations we want to run over data set two. And let's say data set two is ginormous. So then we'd load chunks of data set two in parallel, apply those operations over each chunk in parallel, and then, just, and then just join the results afterwards. So here, I don't know, maybe we'd prepare three tasks, each of which will load a chunk of data set two from disk into RAM. So these tasks will then get fanned out to a pool of Ray workers. Each worker reads a partition of data set two from disk into RAM and then just runs all the operations over each chunk in parallel, and then joins the results after. And so we can pack these tasks onto our cluster without ooms, because Ray does a great job at memory aware scheduling. So, um, and if we're in a resource uh, scarce scenario, we can then run these tasks serially instead of fan them out you know, massively parallelly so that the full data set is never resonant in memory all at once. Now, we can introduce an additional layer of parallelism on this for you know, even better memory safety and better performance, and this is operator parallelism. And this is especially critical if all those operations can't fit in memory all at once. Maybe each operation is actually a, a, an LLM, like literally. So let's say we have all these operations, but we, we can't fit them all in memory all at once. So what we do is we can group the ops so that no group is larger than a certain RAM limit. So we can set this RAM limit based on some you know, environment variable or based on the size of the cluster. And then after we divvy all of them up into their own groups of operations, um, it's almost like we now have three separate workloads to run. And for each sub-workload, we can then apply additional data parallelism on top of that to get all of this amazing chunking here. So as you can see, uh, we've actually split up the operations so that you know, we can control when those operations are loaded in memory at any given time. So we can then fan out those tasks to the worker pool once again. And this is awesome because um, we can use chunking across tasks to achieve memory safety, or we can do parallelism to achieve performance. All right, this is, this is wonderful, but we, we ran into some roadblocks when trying to build this. Uh, the, the main roadblock in particular is job isolation when trying to implement the worker pool. The issue is that these workloads are actually submitted from different API client processes. From Ray's perspective, these are all different drivers, so they don't share resources that you spin up. So if process one spins up a bunch of workers in the cluster, Process two can't use them because it's a different driver. So if process one has actually crowded the cluster with workers, process two has to wait for all that stuff to exit and die before spinning up its own workers from a cold state. And this is fine, but with one big caveat. Spinning up cold workers takes a long time because of expensive imports, and sometimes you, got, you just got to load you know, torch and transformers and whatnot into memory uh, through Python imports. So we actually need these workers to stay super warm. Um, but if those workers stay warm, then again, you know, we run back into that problem. Different API processes can't share them. So we needed a way for all these processes on the left-hand side to have access to the full worker pool on the right-hand side. So how do we get around this problem? The solution is to have all the drivers connect to a broker actor that would fan out tasks across a pool of already warmed up workers. So through this broker, uh, drivers can submit their ta tasks the tasks would get immediately scheduled onto the worker pool. And so that way, all of our drivers can access the shared worker pool. 
So this broker actor lives in the same Ray worker pods that the Ray uh, you know, workers, the task executors live in. And it submits these heartbeat tasks to ensure that Ray workers are warm with the necessary expensive imports and datas and models and whatnot cached in memory before we schedule work on them. And so this really minimizes our execution latency. So just to zoom out, we use data and task parallelism built on top of Ray workers and Ray's memory we're scheduling to achieve both memory safety and performance. But due to some limitations, we need to maintain this broker actor to allow many drivers to share a warmed worker pool, which minimizes our execution latency. All right, so John and I are going to switch off. Uh, John is now going to talk about the in-memory component of the architecture, and then we're going to finish off with some of the limitations with Ray that we had to work around. Take it away, man. Hello, hello. Cool. Hey, everyone. I'm John. I'm a software engineer, and like Will said, I worked on the, uh, the in-core, in-memory component of this architecture, of, of uh, this hybrid architecture. So let's talk about the motivations behind this a bit, right? So if you have I.O. bound operations, obviously you want to have the data cached in memory before the operations are actually performed, so you're not paying that I.O. cost when the request comes in from the user. So um, you know, a good example of this that maybe is relevant to, to this conference is if you're working with large models, if you're working with a BERT model or a CLIP model or a model from the LLAMA series, you definitely don't want to be loading the weights from disk into CPU memory, into GPU memory when a request comes in from the user. You want to pay that cost one time up front and then amortize the cost over the future requests that come in from users so you can just go ahead and pay the cost of the forward pass without having to actually like, load the weights in. Um, and so, what we came up with here is that if the uh, resources, if there's enough resources available within this user system, um, we can go ahead and um, allocate a dedicated pool of resources and we'll allocate individual um, actors to individual users and those actors um, will essentially load the data on boot on initialization and then essentially we can just talk directly to those actors and we don't have to pay those IO costs as requests come into you from, from individual users. So this will become obvious as we trace through some requests um, that go through the interactive part of the system or this uh, in-memory part of the system. So let's say that a request comes in from user one and they want to perform some operations on data set two. So the request comes in from the user, it hits our API layer, it's going to talk to the scheduler. The scheduler is going to look at this dedicated resource pool, and since Ray does memory aware scheduling, it's going to see are there enough resources available within this pool to support the operations that this user wants to perform on the data set that the user wants to perform the operations on top of. In this case, there are resources available, so the scheduler is going to go ahead and allocate an actor for this user. The actor, while it's initializing, will go ahead and load data from disk into memory. It'll perform any relevant pre-processing steps on that data set, and it can do other things like load weights for large models into memory, get them onto the GPU. Once the actor has been fully allocated, um, it's warmed up, now the scheduler can go ahead and just forward requests for this user directly to the actor. So we no longer have to go and put them in these tasks in a queue. We don't have to wait for a pool of shared workers for workers to become available. The scheduler can just forward these requests directly to this actor. The weights are in memory. The data set is in memory. The latency is low in this, in this scenario. So let's trace through one more request. So let's say a request comes in from user two this time to perform operations on data set one. The scheduler, once away, um, again, because it's a resource-aware scheduler, can go ahead and allocate an actor for user two on data set one. Once again, it'll load the data set, perform some pre-processing. Um, let's say this time it's loading the weights for like a Llama 2 family model into memory. And now when requests come in from user two, the scheduler doesn't have to try to allocate something on the shared worker pool. It can just send these requests directly to the dedicated actor. So we'll do this one more time. Let's say that user two now wants to operate on data set two. So the scheduler will look at the pool and it will say, we actually don't have enough room for this actor. It knows the size of data set two, it knows the operations that user two might want to perform, it knows it doesn't have the resources, so it won't um, schedule an actor this time, which is fine because we have the shared out of core worker pool, right? So as these requests come in, we optimistically try to send them to the um, in-memory pool because that's where the latency is the lowest, but if there aren't resources available, we can always fall back to the shared worker pool. Um, after some period of time, let's say that user one logs out of the system, they haven't interacted with this original actor um, in some time, the actor will actually just be evicted um, because it hasn't been interacted with in, in um, a certain period of time. So those resources from that first actor will actually be returned back to the dedicated resource pool, which is great because if user two comes along and they try to allocate an actor again, we'll have enough resources and we'll go ahead and allocate it. 
So we ran through a few example requests, kind of like a few toy requests. We'll talk now about the actor lifecycle. So it's actually not that complex. Let's say that a user request comes in and we want to allocate an actor and the scheduler sees that there are no resources available. Fine, we'll go ahead and just throw it on the shared worker pool. That always works. The shared worker pool has a queue. So requests will always complete um, regardless of if, if you have a dedicated pool of resources at all. But if there are resources available, then the scheduler will go ahead and allocate an actor, right? It's literally like a ray.actor.remote um, call. The, war, the actor will warm itself up, so it knows it needs to load some data set into memory, it needs to perform some pre-processing steps, it needs to essentially load weights onto a GPU if there's a model available. And then once that actor is alive, um, it'll continue essentially heart beating so that we know the actor is alive, and it'll stay alive until one of three conditions fail, or one of three conditions happen. Either the actor fails a heartbeat, so it had some sort of internal error, then we'll go ahead and just evict the actor and return the resources to the pool. If the user doesn't interact with it in a certain TTL, then we'll go ahead and we'll evict the actor. Or if the user performs an operation like they log out of the system, we'll go ahead and just purge the actor from the resource pool because we know it's no longer needed. When the actor's been evicted, um, it'll tear itself down and we'll just return the resources to the pool and then those resources can go to, to serve another future request. So this is the, the life cycle of actors within the, uh, the dedicated resource pool. So we'll talk now a little bit about synchronization. So obviously, Ray is a component of a larger system, the system that we call Snorkel Flow. And so when we're actually interacting with actors, this is done from our API layer, right? So we have um, an API layer. The API layer is horizontally scaled. So we have multiple processes actually scaled across multiple pods. And this is the ideal view of the system, right? Is that for each API process, they all have handles to each and every actor that they might need to interact with. This is the ideal view. But since this is a real life system, the, it often looks a little bit more like this, right? So some API processes know about some actors that exist, but no process, the local state of these processes is not synchronized with the global state as it's stored in the GCS. So we'll talk about kind of the issue of synchronization and how we can get into this state, and then what we're gonna do, and what we um, actually layered on top to, to deal with this. So let's say that a request comes in and it says use actor one. Um, this request comes in, it gets randomly routed to one of our API workers, it goes to API process one. API process one sees that this actor one doesn't exist, so it talks to the GCS, GCS allocates actor one, it returns the handle to actor one to, that, to the, uh, the memory of the first process worker, and that API process can actually use that actor handle to talk directly to the actor, right? So the user wants to essentially perform a forward pass on an LLM, it can now fan that, or, um, al or create that request out to the remote actor, get the results back from the forward pass, and return that to the user. So the request has been completed. But let's say that the user makes another request right after, but this time it gets randomly routed to API process two. So this time API process two doesn't have the actor handle in memory. It actually doesn't know if this actor exists. So the, actor, or the API process has to go and talk to GCS and say what actors exist, and if this actor exists, it has to get the handle back for that actor. This surprisingly can take a long time. It's not so much the network delay, but it's the serialization of the actor class and then the instantiation of the actor on the client side can actually take a relatively long amount of time on the order of a second. And so you, it's not ideal to introduce like a second latency when a request comes in from a user, especially since we already paid the price of allocating the actor previously. So we have something pretty simple, which, oh yeah, so after that comes in, now we have the actor handle in process two, we can actually just go ahead and make the request directly to the actor. So the system is correct, right? A request comes in, the actor exists, it gets routed to a cold process. The process will essentially fetch the handle and talk to the actor directly. It's correct, but it's not ideal. We're paying a latency overhead. So to address this, we essentially have what are called like synchronization threads running in the background of these API processes. And these synchronization threads periodically talk to GCS to go ahead and fetch the global state of what actors exist and synchronize their local state to the global state. So the idea here is that hopefully we're getting all of the handles, we're getting the handles for all of the actors that exist in the local process memory before requests come in for those, for those actors. So in this case, a, a request came in, um, we had already synchronized the handle, then the request came in and we could actually just make the request directly to the remote actor. Um, and this works the same going the other direction too, right? So um, actor one might be killed here by API process one. API process two would still have the stale handle in memory, so it would try to essentially make a request to an actor that no longer exists. The request would fail, you're still paying a latency overhead, so the synchronization actually goes in both directions. We would purge handles from memory that are no longer valid as well. So yeah, so just to summarize, um, getting actor handles can take a surprisingly long time, like on the order of a second, depending on the complexity of the actor. Having them cached beforehand reduces latency, obviously. 
Um, consistency versus latency. So basically, we are always correct. Like we have like a strongly consistent system, but you can reduce the latency by kind of like layering on these synchronization primitives um, over on top the the API layer. And for future work, ideally, we wouldn't have to talk to GCS to in order to converge the local state of the processes with the global state of the system. We could have like a gossip protocol between the API workers. There's a whole bunch of other really cool things that, that you could do here um, in the future work. So zooming out on the in-memory part of this architecture, uh, if you want to run IO-bound operations over data sets that can fit in memory, then you want to work on this part of our hybrid ar architecture. We pay the IO cost up front when we're allocating these actors, and then we amortize that cost over the lifespan of the actor. Um, actors are interacted with directly from the API layer, so you have to have the actor handles in memory at the API layer. Um, we have some simple systems to kind of like improve latency by converging the local state of those API processes to the global state of the GCS. And if the resources aren't available, that's fine. We always fall back to the shared part of the system. So we'll now just talk about Ray and kind of like some of the speed bumps that we ran into while we were building the system. What we found is that while Ray was a great fit for this system, it was kind of designed to be used in a way that wasn't quite aligned with um, kind of like the real-time aspect of the system. So we'll, we'll go over a few of these speed bumps. I'll hand it back to Will. This is one of the first limitations we ran into. We've already talked about this, so we can just fly through this. We can't really configure job isolation in Ray, so different drivers can't share resources, which kind of sucks. What we really want is this. We want for all processes to share the same pool of you know, warmed up resources, whether they be Ray workers or Ray actors or whatnot. So the solution was to introduce a broker actor in the middle that would fan out tasks across a already warmed up pool of workers. And Ray makes this really easy to implement. You just spin up a detached actor, and if you want to say run foo on the left-hand side, you would submit it to the actor, so the broker actor, via broker.exec or something on the right-hand side. And so this actor will then submit those actual Ray tasks to the cluster to be run on the worker pool. And we're working on making this more fault tolerant. We also noticed this thing where tasks would take a really long time to execute. And the reason for this is that when functions get serialized and then sent to the cluster, Pickle will include the referenced imports as well in the function closure. So while the serialized function is on its way to the Ray cluster, on the way it might get unpickled from time to time, which leads to dramatic slowdowns because unpickling causes arbitrary code execution. So if those imports are actually in the top level, that code will get executed during an unpickle. If the import is expensive, then we're going to see it every single time. To alleviate this, we can move all of the expensive imports into the function body itself to avoid arbitrary execution from unpickles. Switching back to John. Yeah. One other uh, limitation that we ran into is just basically cold workers. So we have the worker pool that was shown for the, the out of core part of the architecture. And if you don't interact with these workers um, periodically, they actually go cold, so they get reallocated by Ray. And we pay a relatively significant startup cost uh, just because of all the modules that we have to import and other initialization steps that we have in these workers. And so a pretty simple solution here actually was just to heartbeat these from time to time. And so the broker actor was a great um, abstraction to use to, to actually manage these heartbeats because it actually knew the, the um, scope of all the, the workers that existed. So the broker actor basically just had a background loop that would go along and periodically ping the workers and just keep them alive. So we paid that warm-up cost one time when the workers were originally allocated, and then essentially, again, you just amortize that cost over the, the lifespan of the workers, uh, which is shown here, just fanning out heartbeat tasks to the, to the individual workers. Uh, so rate limitation four. So maybe you all have seen this, but when you allocate an actor, and if you want it to take up uh, one GPU and there's no GPUs available, the actor will just hang until the GPU becomes available, right? Like let's say there are GPUs allocated, they exist within the cluster, but they're currently used by other actors. The default functionality of Ray is to actually just like hang until those GPUs become available. So this is fine if you're just a data scientist who's trying to fan out some jobs that run overnight, maybe those GPUs will become available, you're fine if, if your actor takes a while to boot up. But this actually doesn't work great in our system where we have requests coming in that are supposed to be low latency and there's a bunch of users using the system that all expect relatively low latency on the request, we can't just try to allocate an actor and then just wait forever in order for it to be allocated. And Ray doesn't give you a way to essentially fail the actor.remote request immediately if there aren't resources available. So what we had to do is essentially figure out how long it takes for these actors to be allocated, and then if um, at a timeout, if the request to allocate doesn't complete in that time, 
go ahead and end the request, assume that the actor cannot be allocated, and then debounce requests that come in, similar requests, for a certain amount of time so you don't just like spend a bunch of time trying to allocate actors when there aren't resources available for them. So this was uh, one of kind of the incongruities that we ran into when we were trying to use Ray in order to build a real-time system like this. And I believe that concludes our talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, questions? A very short question. Uh, what kind of work, I mean, maybe you know from your experience, what type of work is the one that happens when you get an actor handle that can take up to a second? Because yeah, that number is quite large. Yeah, depending on the complexity of the actor, essentially there's a certain amount of like serialization that happens in order for you to get the actor handle back. The Ray assumes that you actually don't have the actor class defined locally, and so it like it pickles it back from the store of actor handles on remote. And that process, depending on the complexity of the actor, you can end up paying the same pickling cost that was discussed in the other limitation. So it's not like the network traffic of getting this uh, this blob over the network, but it's actually the instantiation of the actor locally and and the serialization of it from the remote. Yeah, so for example, if, say, you reference things in the function closure, or if you even have references to certain types in your type definition of a function uh, of an actor method, sometimes that stuff can get you know, included with the function serialization or the class, serializ uh, the class definition when you serialize. So. Uh, I guess, like, when you were debugging these issues, like, what was your like debugging workflow, I guess. Cause I, Cause I think like, yeah, I mean just parsing through rate logs like can be extremely painful in TDS. So like I'm just curious like if you guys had any better ways of doing it. Let me, let me, let me tell you man, like. <laughs> I, think, I think one time I put a debugger in the Ray lib and then deployed it to the remote cluster and then exec in and attached the debugger so I could inspect the unpickling process to try and figure out what was actually happening. So that could have been a little bit better. And yeah, I think we've all run into the issue of trying to look for a log and then you just end up in a directory with 50,000 files in it. That's a bunch of UUIDs for different like worker tasks and the lifespan is pretty short. So uh, not great, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you something I did as well. Sometimes I would print out tracebacks like in the you know, top level, I guess, uh, scope of a Python program so that I could see where that unpickling was happening. So if an unpickle accidentally arbitrarily executed code, I could actually see the in the log. So we can, we can talk about this more offline as well. We had so many tricks. <laughs> yeah, we should put that in the talk, actually. Yeah. yeah. Next time. Yeah. But cool. for the issue of uh, synchronization, so what do you do for the, what do you do like when the API process receives a request but like hasn't, synchron or hasn't synced with the GCS yet? Yeah. So like if, because um, you, you only run at intervals, right? So like if you haven't like synced it correctly, then like, um, yeah, I guess like will du will duplicate actors get created or like what happens when it's deleted? Yeah, if we don't have the actor's handle in memory, we have to assume that the actor exists and we just don't have the handle. So then we have to pay that cost for the GCS. We have to go round trip to the GCS at that time. Um, likewise, kind of like the symmetric case is if a request comes in for a handle, we assume the handle is valid, we try to use it. You might hit a gRPC error because it's trying to talk to a port that's been closed because the actor no, no longer exists, and then we essentially purge the handle from memory and then put it on either the shared pool or we try to allocate the, the referenced actor. So basically we always are correct, but we might end up trying to talk to an actor that doesn't exist or we might have to go and talk to GCS to grab a handle that was referenced. Yeah, because we're, we're using detached named actors, so it's how we're referencing them. So the user data set combination gives you like a unique name for the actor. These are detached actors, and so we can actually just like look them up from, from the GCS. Uh, I think we're running out of time, so we can do the rest offline. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yep, cool.